The Korean War is often referred to as the Forgotten War, and a forgotten war creates forgotten heroes. Among those heroes is Royce Williams. On November 18, 1952, four Panthers launched off the USS Oriskany. Lead section was Lieutenant Claire Elwood with Lieutenant J.G. John Middleton on his wing, and the wing section was led by Lieutenant Royce Williams with Lieutenant J.G. Dave Rollins on his wing. They were launched to intercept seven MiGs that had taken off out of the base at Vladivostok. There was a NASA security agency team aboard the heavy cruiser USS Helena, and they suspected that the MiGs were launching to seek revenge for the American strike that the Oriskany Air Wing had done earlier that morning on the North Korean city of Haryong. So something to note right up front is the MiG-15 was a superior air-to-air -air fighter compared to the Panther. The MiG-15 was faster, had a better turn rate, and had higher caliber armament. The Panther was a sturdy airplane. It was the U.S. Navy's first carrier-based frontline fighter aircraft, which also was used heavily in the attack role during the Korean War, but it was at a disadvantage when facing the MiG-15. So the weather was terrible when the Panthers launched off of Oriskany, and they were basically in the clouds until they broke out at about 12,000 feet. When they reached 16,000 feet, Lieutenant Royce Williams called Tally Ho on seven contrails coming at them from high above. And about that same time, the flight lead, Lieutenant Elwood, reported that he had a fuel pump warning light. The ship directed he and his wingman to return overhead, and so now Royce and his wingman were 2v7. As the MiGs rapidly descended, the contrails went away and Royce lost his tally. He asked the ship's controller if he had him on radar, and he did not. At that point, Royce and his wingman were directed to do a 180 and return back towards the ship to establish a combat air patrol barrier between the Oriskany and the MiG's last known position. And as he was halfway through that turn, the MiG's appeared at his 10 o'clock. I had the opportunity to sit down with Royce at the recent Tailhook convention, so let me let him pick up the story from here. And in that turn, here come four MiG's at my 10 o'clock, all firing made a hard turn as they kind of came in and wrapped around right behind number four, tracked him, pulled the trigger, and he dropped out of the formation, and my wingman followed him. At that point, they climbed rapidly into the sun, and the other three came around from the other side. So I am tracking these three who are now splitting, and the guy I thought, I was going to shoot it, and I looked over and his wingman is coming dead at me and shooting. And I aimed at him, tracked, I fired, and he quit, but he just kept coming. I'm assuming he's dead. He just came on by while I'm still shooting at him. So from then on, it was just one airplane after another, sort of going up on the perch, waiting their time in an attack. And so my attention was primarily what's behind me. And I'm flying full throttle, 26,000 feet level, maneuvering to save my life. They normally would do what a good fighter pro would do. They would make the run, then they make a high pitch at a rate that I couldn't follow. So I'm just rebating down here. And so the next guy comes in. It's just after that, after that. One of them came down and did not do that climb. And I turned into, at a real close range, in a short shot, and pieces of the airplane were coming off. And I almost hit there. I had to violently maneuver to not find your own motors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The okay. parts. Roger. And it continued that way until I got the next opportunity, and I yeah. hit this guy, and he's slowing down, smoking, dropping out, and I ran out of ammunition. And I'm looking back, and here's a guy that take advantage of my inattention to saving my butt. He nailed me, and uh, and so I made a hard turn, and he hit me in that uh, with the 37 millimeter right at the wing butt of the fuselage, and it exploded in the accessory section of the engine. The only control I really had was the elevator. Okay. I had some control with two hands on the stick manually to make some directional change. Elevator. And he's sitting right directly behind me at about 400 feet, just ideal for and he's shooting, and I'm using what I had, and I would, I happened to be luckily at that point aiming directly back to the task force. Okay. So I'm heading home, and I'm pushing the stick down, 
and I see the bullets over me. I thought I was going to get nailed because this guy was just pumping away, but he missed me and I plowed into the clouds and I lost sight of him and probably likewise he me. And in the moment I realized I was safe except for what problem I might have with the airplane. They gave me a, a Charlie in the land, and I'm now talking to the LSO. So I'm telling them about the speed problem, and uh, they say to the captain, uh, he's coming in hot, can you kick it up a bit? And the captain says, any speed he wants. Then the next thing I say, I can't line up with you. And the captain of the ship, at the last moment, turned it and lined it up perfectly with me, and I made a beautiful landing. After Royce lands, they count 263 holes in his airplane, made by both 23mm and 37mm bullets from the MiG-15s. One of the rounds went into the engine accessory section. If it had been just forward of that, it would have hit a spar and blown his wing off. If it had been just aft of that, it would have blown his engine up. Royce used every one of the 760 rounds of 20mm that he had. So the maintainers pull everything they can salvage out of the airplane and then push it overboard. Meanwhile, down in the ready room, Royce is confused by what's going on. And in his words... This is where the story starts. So Royce had accomplished what no other American fighter pilot had accomplished. He shot down four MiG-15s in one flight. But when he gets down to the ready room, he's confused by what's going on. Apparently, Washington has told the intelligence officers they want a sanitized version of the story, and they're already in work in creating that even before they're debriefed by Royce. In fact, they don't even want to talk to Royce initially. Royce's gun camera footage disappears, and they order the Ortiz to point his wingman's airplane over the side and fire the gun. So it looks like he did fire during the engagement. There is real fear at the highest levels of government that this incident could change the Korean police action into World War III. And as far as the U.S. Navy is concerned, the fight never happened. A couple days later, the Oriskany pulls into port in Yokosuka, Japan, and Royce is ordered to go see Vice Admiral Robert Briscoe, who is the commander of Naval Forces Far East. Admiral Briscoe starts the meeting by telling Royce that, in fact, he did shoot down three and a probable fourth Soviet MiG-15, based on what the NSA team aboard Helena was able to glean from the communications they heard. But then he goes on to order Royce to never talk about the event. So the Admiral also tells Royce that he's going to be awarded a Silver Star for one kill and a probable. But he goes on to say they're going to credit Lieutenant Elwood with a kill based on the fact that he fired his guns at the end of the engagement, although he was way out of range and the guy was already on his way home. And Royce's wingman, Lieutenant J.G. Rowlands, is going to get the Distinguished Flying Cross for a probable kill although he never pulled his trigger during the engagement at all. So this is the official story that Royce is sworn to, and this is the official story that the Navy's History and Heritage Command retains to this day. So Royce goes on to have a long career in the Navy after that. He retires as a captain in 1980, and he doesn't tell anyone the truth for this entire time. Fast forward to 1991, the Iron Curtain falls, Cold War is over, and eventually, the Russians reveal that Royce did, in fact, shoot down three and a probable fourth. The pilots were Captain Belyakov, Captain Vandalov, Lieutenant Pakhomkin, and Lieutenant Tarshinov of the Air Defense Forces of the Red Air Force. Vandalov, Pakhomkin, and Tarshinov were directly shot down in the flight, and flight leader Belyakov was badly shot up and crash-landed and was killed when he attempted to land once he returned to Soviet territory. So on November 18, 1952, Lieutenant Royce Williams became the top-scoring carrier-based jet pilot in the Korean War. And despite a number of efforts to set the record straight since the end of the Cold War, the U.S. Navy has refused to do so on the basis that there are no witnesses alive to verify Williams' account. And despite the fact that the Russians have published the names of the pilots that were shot down by Williams. The bottom line is this isn't fair. Royce Williams single-handedly saved the USS Oriskany and Task Force 77 from an attack by Soviet MiGs. He prevailed in an inferior aircraft and then managed to get that stricken aircraft back aboard through superior airmanship and great courage. His actions rise to the level of conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. He deserves the Medal of Honor.
So the latest effort to upgrade Royce's award from Silver Star to Medal of Honor have been led by retired Rear Admiral Donovan Shelton. Admiral Shelton's awards package has been endorsed by the DFW, the VFW, the American Legion, Navy League, 211 retired flag and general officers, the current commander of Naval Air Forces, also known as the Air Boss, but it's stalled on the desk of the Secretary of the Navy because of focus on other events, particularly the Afghan pullout. I'm asking my YouTube channel community's help in ensuring that the Secretary of the Navy keeps his focus on upgrading this award for Royce. So here's the address for the Secretary of the Navy. And in the episode description below, I've added some draft language for a letter to the Secretary of the Navy. Your efforts here can make a difference and we can ensure justice is served in this lifetime for a great American warrior. I thank you in advance for making this effort on Royce's behalf. That'll do it for this episode. And as always, I look forward to talking to you again soon.